Whether or not smokers should get lung transplants is a specific instance of a more general problem, which is that there is competition for medical resources. Whether you live in a country like mine, where healthcare is free, for the moment, or somewhere else where you have to pay for it, there isn't always enough to go around. And the prime example of this, though by no means the only one, is waiting lists for transplant organs. There aren't enough organs, so somebody needs to make the decision about who's gonna get them and who's gonna go without. What we as philosophers are interested in is how can we make that decision? Suppose that we've got two patients, Smith and Jones. Both of them need a double lung transplant. Now let's say that they're the same age and neither of them have any underlying conditions and everything that might help us to make a decision is completely the same between both of them, except that Smith is a smoker. He has damaged his lungs by smoking and now he needs new ones, whereas Jones's lungs are damaged because he's got cystic fibrosis or some other condition that he's not even partially responsible for. We've only got two lungs and we can't give one to each because that's not how lung transplants work, so who gets them? Now you might say that that could never happen, no two patients would ever be so identical, but the point of the hypothetical scenario is to try and isolate the question, to what extent does being responsible for your bad health affect whether you should be deprioritized when it comes to saving your life. Smith chose to smoke. Let's say he knew the risks. Now he needs new lungs. Jones also needs new lungs. Does that mean we should prioritize Jones's life over his? Jeff McMahon, whose name you will recognize if you've seen my video on Just Wars, says yes. In that case, Jones should get the lungs which means Smith dies. He actually starts from a very uncontroversial position. McMahon says, look, if you hurt somebody, say you bumped into them with your car, when we don't have our philosopher skeptic hats on, most people would accept, and the law would accept, that you are required to compensate them. Maybe you're required to pay their medical bills or compensate them for loss of income. You caused harm to them, even if you didn't mean to, so you should be the one to put that harm right you are morally liable. And he goes on to say, suppose that you injured them and they needed a blood transfusion and you were the only viable donor. By the same principles as before, you could be morally required to donate some of your blood to save their life. If you put someone in harm's way, you are morally liable for getting them out of it. And here's the final step. Smith chose to smoke. Let's say he knew the risks and the potential consequences. Now he needs new lungs. Jones also needs new lungs, which means Jones is at risk. If Smith wasn't in the picture, Jones would just get those lungs, no conflict scenario. In other words, Smith has voluntarily committed some action that put Jones in harm's way. He contributed to the competition for organs. And so, McMahon says, by the exact same principles of compensation which most people accept every day and which the law accepts, Smith is morally liable to reverse that harm. In this case, by being disqualified from the transplant decision-making process. If we had enough lungs to go around, then everybody who needed them would get them. McMahon is not recommending that Smith the smoker be punished for smoking here, but he says he has endangered Jones's life by putting himself on the transplant waiting list. Note that whilst Smith the smoker is also competition from Jones's point of view, Jones isn't responsible for his being there because he's got cystic fibrosis. He hasn't committed any voluntary action of any kind that has led to his being there, so he is not responsible for the threat that he poses to Smith's life. It's worth pointing out that McMahon intends this principle to be generalizable. If you are responsible for your own bad health through smoking, drinking, drugs, attempting suicide, or anything else, and there's somebody else who needs those medical resources, then you go to the back of the queue. Dan Wickler points out what some of the consequences of adopting McMahon's theory as healthcare policy would be, and they're pretty drastic. Suppose that we did accept this and put policies into place enforcing it. What would the world look like? 
Well, for starters, pretty much all cases of sexually transmitted infection get deprioritised, except those involving rape. If we've got £50,000 in a healthcare budget, and we need to decide whether to give that to treating STIs or treating cystic fibrosis, well, you knew the risks when you had sex. Now you've committed some voluntary action which contributes to the competition for healthcare resources, so you go to the back of the queue. And it's not just the minor STIs like chlamydia either. Most cases of AIDS, except where there's been rape or an infected blood transfusion, get sent to the back of the queue and it doesn't matter how many there are. If we could save the lives of a million people with AIDS, let's say none of them qualify for those two exemptions, or one person with cystic fibrosis, cystic fibrosis gets it. You're pregnant? Well, unless it was rape, you knew the risks when you had sex, so you go to the back of the queue. You sought out alternative therapies and allowed yourself to get worse before going to your doctor, and now you need more medical resources to make you better. Well, you go to the back of the queue. You're obese, or you're an alcoholic, you go to the back of the queue. This policy is going to cause quite a bit of suffering. Wickler also points out that it's not always easy to determine just how responsible somebody is for their bad health. For instance, both he and McMahon discuss alcoholism. Alcoholism is a disease. Nobody chooses to be an alcoholic. But you do choose to drink, which you have to do before you become an alcoholic. So, do alcoholics get deprioritized for liver transplants or not? And to what extent are you really responsible for bad habits like smoking or drinking if you had bad role models? Are you responsible enough for us to deprioritize your life? And how are we going to measure that? Lastly, and perhaps most importantly, there's evidence that people's judgments of whether actions are voluntary or involuntary may well be unreliable. Wickler cites a study in the journal Bioethics in which participants were asked to decide who would get transplant organs in hypothetical conflict scenarios. Subjects were significantly less willing to distribute organs to intravenous drug users than to cigarette smokers or people eating high-fat diets, even when intravenous drug users had better transplant outcomes than other patients. Subjects' allocation decisions were influenced by transplant prognosis, but not by whether the behaviour in question was causally responsible for the patient's organ failure. People's unwillingness to give scarce transplantable organs to patients with controversial behaviours cannot be explained totally on the basis of those behaviours either causing their primary organ failure or making them have worse transplant prognoses. Instead, many people believe that such patients are simply less worthy of scarce transplantable organs. Now that is only one study, but the problem that it highlights is that if we were to adopt McMahon's theory as policy, the selection committees which make these decisions could well be biased, and we need to take that into account. If people can't reliably distinguish voluntary from involuntary, then the chances of putting this policy in place fairly, which was the whole point, remember, could be pretty slim. The criticism that I take away from Wickler is that whilst McMahon's theory may well be fairer, it would actually end up causing more suffering than the current system, especially disproportionate suffering to A, the poorer members of society, who are more likely to smoke or be obese, and B, women, who are the ones who get pregnant. Now, if you are not a consequentialist about morality, then maybe that doesn't bother you. I've known a fair few doctors over the years, the ones that I've known tend to be pretty consequentialist, so I can't imagine this theory being especially popular. But what do you guys think? If you're responsible for your own bad health, should you be deprioritized for healthcare? And how can we get around the problems that that might throw up? Next time, we could either do Can You Trust Testimony or Should You Obey the Law? For more philosophical videos every Friday, please subscribe. Yes, the background has changed because I'm at home for spring break. Last time we asked, what is imagination? So let's see what you guys had to say. Iredal Resurrected asked, what is the link between imagination and creativity? Well, one of the papers that I referenced last time, the one by Beres Gort, actually talks about that. He's a philosopher of creativity. He says that imagination isn't necessary for creativity, but because of the kind of mental state that it is, it's a great vehicle for creativity. So you don't have to use it, but it does help. Now, as a matter of fact, I've suggested some amendments to that paper to him, and his definition of creativity isn't exactly what I would go for, and he's been very complimentary about the definition that I developed when he was teaching me, but there you go. That's what one of the leading minds in the field thinks, and, and personally, I, I think he's pretty much 100% correct. 
Tom Millie Music suggested that the question of what imagination is would be better suited to a scientific investigation rather than a philosophical one. Well, I can definitely agree that the question of what exactly goes on in somebody's head when they are imagining something is definitely a question for science, but if we're asking what goes on when this process is happening, it would be useful to know what exactly the process is that we're talking about, what, what exactly the concept refers to. Now, I'm not saying that every scientific investigation into imagination has to be preceded by several paragraphs of philosophy. I think that if scientific experiments were being conducted, obviously a folk concept of imagination, the one that we all kind of have before we do analysis, would serve to do that. But my point is that the two different approaches aren't mutually exclusive, and it almost seems like they're not quite trying to answer the same questions there. Karimbo575 asked, What if we are modal realists and we believe that every possible world really concretely exists? What are we going to say about imagination then? Because the analytic model of imagination says that imagination is entertaining something without being committed to the idea that it truly exists. But if you're a modal realist, then every possibility truly exists. So what's going on? We can't explain what imagination is. That's a very, very astute observation. Well done for noticing it. I think we could probably fairly simply devise a workaround. The analytic imagination theorist would just say, okay, imagining something is entertaining it without being committed to its actually existing, existing in the actual world, which is this one, as opposed to any possible worlds. There were quite a few odd comments underneath the episode as well, from Rushing With Love 007 said that if you can imagine something, it must exist. I'm, I'm not really seeing how, how that follows. I wish it were true though. Smoke <laughs> weed every day. Uh, I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed it. That's all the time we've got this week. Sorry there weren't any more comments. I had to film this episode earlier than I normally do. But thank you very much for watching, and I will see you in the next episode. Bye! You're required to pay their medical bills, or maybe cons. <laughs>